everyone. This is Dr. Belinda Wilkerson from Steps to the Future coming to you at College Conversations. So you want to be an IRS enrolled agent. Now, somebody was asking me one day, they said, well, how did you choose this career uh, pathway to talk about this time? And it happened because one of my students told me that she was interested in this particular career. Okay, I had I had never heard of an IRS enrolled agent, so I said, okay, let me do a little bit of research and see who I can find out there. And I was fortunate enough to um, realize that I was in a Facebook group with um, our current, what our uh, guest from today. So let me give you a little background before I bring her on screen. So our guest today is um, Amber Whitehead, who is the owner of Whitehead Tax and Financial Services, LLC, which is a woman minority owned small tax firm based in Vernon, Connecticut. My old stomping grounds, I was in Rhode Island, so not too far away. She specializes in centering on individual taxation and home service based small businesses. So any of you small businesses out there, you're looking for someone, you know, we're doing everything virtual these days. So you definitely could, you know, contact Ms. Whitehead. They also provide representation services for individuals that may need help during an audit and or help with the burden of tax debt. So we're going to bring Ms. Whitehead on now and she's going to just give her some information about who she is. Hi. So, hi, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, folks out there, please make sure if you have any comments, you know, stick it in the uh, comment section so we can answer your question and make sure you show us some love out there. You know, I want to see some of those emojis going up there so we know people right. are paying attention and, and getting some information here. So, Miss Whitehead, tell us a little bit about your educational background, first of all. Okay. So I received my bachelor's in accounting from Central Connecticut State University. And then probably I would say maybe five or six years later, I decided to pursue my master's degree. So I end up, um, I was had just given birth to my first and only child. So it was like, I know I want to get my master's degree, but I know I cannot physically be in a classroom. So what was the best way for me to do that? So I went and I saw DeVry and I registered for DeVry through their business school, Keller, and I did their online. And I did that okay. straight through and I received my master's degree um, from DeVry University. Okay. So, yeah. so so, tell me a little bit. So now after you, um, you graduated from college with your Bachelor of Science in Accounting, went on to DeVry and got your MBA. So how did you move into this world of taxation and you know i see i'm one of those people that's afraid of doing taxes <laughs> you, you know i'm not a financial person so i'm always fascinated when someone that's their passion that's that's their skill set because it is not mine at all <laughs> right you know what's funny is that i never saw myself doing taxes as a, a career or even starting it as a small business owner um, I've always did taxes since I was 16 years old. As soon as I got my first job, I was always doing my own taxes. So I don't know what it feels like to hire someone, you know, to prepare taxes because it's just something I was doing. And then because I was good at it, I ended up doing family and friends taxes. And that's kind of where it like started. But even still, I was not serious about it. It wasn't, I had friends used to tell me all the time, you need to start your own business. I'm like, no, that's not my career path. I want to be a CPA. I want to work at a CPA firm, become a partner. And that's how I wanted to live my life. Couldn't tell me anything otherwise. But it wasn't until I was unemployed for two and a half years. So it was during the 2008 when the whole housing uh, crisis happened and everything just went around, almost like what's going on now, except we have COVID. Yes. So it was at that point where I realized there's no such thing as job security. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put myself in a position where if that was to ever occur again, that wouldn't just be my livelihood. I would have a backup plan. So that's when I got serious about it. And I started, you know, I created the company in April of 2012. And I just been building upon it um, ever since then. This is my eighth year that I just finished out doing for taxes. I still work full time and I'm accountant at UConn. Okay. Uh, so 
that's where that's where it ended up being for me. Okay. Okay. So tell me, so what is an enrolled agent? Right. So that <laughs> that is a term, even when I tell clients, you know, I'm an IRS enrolled agent, they're like, okay, what is that? Because a lot of people, they're more familiar with the term CPA, right? Okay. You know, certified public accountant. You know, you think of that person, you think of that's who you're going to to prepare your taxes. If you're not doing it yourself. Um, and I did, wasn't even, I wasn't even sure what a, an IRS enrolled agent was until I really got into my business and I wanted, I'm always thinking about how to uh, excel in my career. And I came across an enrolled agent where it specialized, enrolled agents specialize um, in tax and or they can specialize and representation. But the true meaning of an um, enrolled agent is a person who has earned the privilege of representing taxpayers before the IRS. Um, and we have to pass a three-part exam, somewhat like how a CPA have to pass, you know, a three-part exam as well. And then we have to maintain that status by making sure we do at least 72 hours of continued education. Somewhat is the same way like a CPA, they have to maintain their license by doing continued education credits as well. So that's how I decided. I said, this is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to um, go for the CPA license because that was, you know, when you when you become a CPA, that includes like auditing, accounting, and tax. And I really just wanted just to focus on tax, you know, and so when I looked at the enrolled agent uh, credential, that spoke more to me versus becoming a CPA. Okay. All right. That That's really good to know. So let's back up a little bit. So your day job, you said you're, you're an accountant at UConn. Correct. So tell me, so what, so typically what types of things are you doing within that um, position? So I handle um, capital assets. So when you know, UConn has a new building they're, they're constructing, mm -hmm. keeping the cost of that. If they do any renovations, I also do reconcile bank reconciliations for the um, for UConn. We have like 10 different bank accounts that we have to reconcile. Uh, just monthly close, quarterly closes, just to um, get the financials in order. So basically, my role is just to make sure that I'm doing my entries my reconciliations. So that way, when it's time to produce the financial statement, everything is reported correctly. Okay. All right. And how long have you been doing that at UConn? Well, I've been at UConn now roughly close to three years. Okay. okay. Yeah. So how, so how does one, how does one get into a position at a college doing accounting type work? Is it just a matter of applying for the opening or is there any special anything that you have to do besides having the qualifications yes you definitely have to um just apply for the opening because that's what i did i saw it and i said you know what it's a state job you know state benefits <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know but it's it's very very hard to get into universities or colleges or even just a state job because it's very competitive okay. um even when I was applying, my my boss, she told me that she had applied like six, seven times before she even wow. got an interview, okay. you know, but now she's been there, you know, over 10 years. So it's definitely competitive, but definitely have the qualifications um, for it. Most um, accounting jobs at least require you to at least have a bachelor's degree. Okay. Yeah, and that's important because I think sometimes... Um, Students aren't exactly sure where, how much education they may need um, for particular jobs. And so that's, that's entry level. You need at least a bachelor's to bachelor's. get into accounting. Yes. To get into accounting. So what's a typical day like for you? Well, I know we don't have typical days anymore. With <laughs> <laughs> so what was a typical day like beforehand? And then what does your work day look like now? Well, actually, for me, it's pretty much the same. So the only difference is that I'm working from home, so I don't have to worry about that commute aspect. Yes. But because, you know, I work full time and I have my business as well, what I typically do is I wake up a couple of hours earlier before I start my day job or before I have to drive pre-COVID um, just so I can work on my business, whether that is finishing up some tax returns, you know, sending out emails, any kind of administrative work. 
Then I go do my nine to five. When I come back home or log off the computer, I take a little <laughs> break and then I go back and I start back on my business. Okay. And I do that for another, you know, at least till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Mm, okay. okay. So it's a lot. It's all about balance. <laughs> yes. So for those of you out there that are thinking about doing this type of work or starting your own business, but you also have a day job, you, again, as, as Ms. Whitehead said, you have to learn how to do that balancing because you know you don't want to give up your day job if if your if your side hustle isn't isn't going to take care of everything. So you right. really gotta you really have to get that in, under control. So tell me, what's the most rewarding part of your work at UConn and the work that you're doing in your own business? I would say the rewarding part uh, working at UConn is just still learning you know, the counting theory, the concepts, because it's one thing when you go to school mm -hmm. and you learn this stuff versus actually putting it to work. Hands-on experience, it to me is, you know, crucial. So applying those theories to what you are doing um, is exciting for me and it's a challenge, you know, because sometimes, you know, I may not have, I may not know how to do something but then I have, you know, my supervisors or my boss to kind of, you know, wheel me back in and just show me the ropes or whatever. So I like that part. I like good challenges. Um, as far as with the tax business, the most rewarding part is that I love people. I love helping people. I love explaining to them why they're in a certain tax position that they are and how they can come out from it. I love working with small business owners because I know there's a gap of knowledge. Um that they are not aware of on the type of deductions that they can take as being a small business owner. So I love being able to give them that knowledge and then being able to alleviate tax debt for people. You know, I had a client who owed $32,000 to the IRS and we settled for $25 and I called them on their vacation to let them know their offer was accepted for $25. So that made me feel really, really good about it. That and that's why, I love being a road agent because it puts me in a position to be able to do those type of things for people. That is absolutely fantastic. That person, <laughs> must, that person must have been so happy and feeling like, "Whoa, this is my birthday, an early right. birthday gift." That is wonderful. So, what's the most challenging part of what of the work that you do? So, as far as being a, um, a IRS enrolled agent, I would just say the constant changes of the tax law and the ability to read it because there's a lot of loopholes. Mm. So, to really <laughs> understand the tax law in itself can be difficult. You know, it's almost like you have to be a lawyer to really kind of understand, you know, the verbiage in certain tax laws. So, I would say that's the, the most difficult part. So, you really have to have strong reading comprehension, critical thinking, and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Like I have mentors and peers that I always bounce ideas off of. And you have to okay. feel confident to know that you can do that because we're not supposed to know everything, right? Right. I love what you said about having mentors and colleagues that you can ask questions of. Because one of the things I find is that young folks, are reluctant sometimes to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because again, they think, oh, I'm supposed to know how to do this. I find many of my students when they transition to college, one of the uh, challenges that they have is, is going over to the tutoring center or going over to the writing center or going to their advisor before they start getting in trouble um, academically because they don't want to ask for help because right. they, they should be able to do it all. So I love it that you said that. I love that you talked about mentors because mentorship is it, crucial. It's yes, crucial. it is. It's crucial. So tell me, what kind of things do you do? You were talking about the, um, you know, keeping on, on top of all the tax laws and how things can change. And, you know, there are all those loopholes. So you got to know what those are also. How do you stay on top of all that? Like, what is what is your professional development look like? Well, because I am an IRS enrolled agent, we are required to take continuing education classes. So I try to take classes where um, maybe I may feel I'm weak in a certain area. So I will take a course, you know, based on that so that way I can gain, you know, more knowledge in that area. Um, 
I read books, especially about, you know, for small business owners. Um, so that way I can familiarize myself with other tax deductions that they could possibly take that I don't even know that they could take. So I'm always constantly trying to educate myself because the more I can become better at what I do and become more of a better expert, the better I am to service the taxpayer out there. Okay. So we've got a um, couple of questions here from uh, Miss Alexander. So her questions, uh -huh. uh, so she did ask, one of her questions is, you know, your typical day in your EA role. So when you, so when you're working as an enrolled agent, how does that look? Is it, you know, you just, like you said, diving into uh, something that you were working on? How much conversation are you having back and forth with clients? Right. So I would say overall, because my main focus, I have two focus levels. So tax preparation and representation for people who are struggling with tax debt. So I'm constantly on the phone doing consultations with people who have tax debt, trying to figure out what the best resolution may be for them. I also have consultation with just taxpayers who just need help with tax filings or correcting returns that were done wrong. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that, you know, I do that's, you know, typically in, uh, that I do in a day. Okay. So here's another question from Ms. Alexander. So would any college classes help if one isn't planning to get a bachelor's? So I would definitely say if you are trying to be self-employed and you want to start your own business, definitely take some type of business management class, whether it be, you know, a, a certificate, learn marketing, learn accounting, learn a little bit of bookkeeping. And if you want to go into taxes, definitely take, you know, a tax course. Because all those things are going to be very essential to you starting your business, right? You need to know um, business management because you need to know how to um, start your business and what systems you need to be putting in place. You need to know accounting. So that way you are trying to do your own books. You're keeping track of, you know, the, your income and your expenses. So that way you can do the bookkeeping on that side. Um, okay. when I first graduated from college, I started my role as an auditor for the healthcare industry. So with me, I already have my auditors hat on whenever I'm dealing with a client, <laughs> you know, okay. so I go in with the, you know, skepticism because not everybody is going to be honest. So you have to <laughs> ask the right questions to get the, okay. the answer out. And then also I wear my auditor hat when I'm dealing with my small business clients, because I want to be able to put them in a position that if they were to ever to get audited, they will have everything they need to prove themselves in that audit. Okay. So having that background helps me analyze and put things in order for them. Yep. So thank you, Katrina, put in, in the comments for us to let other folks know she's posting on Facebook, uh, letting us know that business management, tax courses, marketing, accounting, bookkeeping are just a few of the courses to take. Thank you, Katrina. Right. I, I, I definitely appreciate you putting that out there because it's it's so important. I, I think sometimes, as I said, when young folks are trying to decide a career pathway. And sometimes I'm like, you know, okay, they're only 17 years old. How do you, how do you know what you want to do for the rest of your life? You know, I know adults that are still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. <laughs> right. So, so this is really, this is really good. So how, um, so you told us about how you began your career. Um, so are there professional associations that you belong to? Yes, I actually, and there's several, Okay. Um, associations that you can become a part of. Right now, I'm part of um, NAEA, which is the National Counting National Association of Enrolled Agents. So that's the one organization that I'm a part of. Okay. And, how, mm -hmm. and do they have, well, you know, right now with COVID, everybody's doing everything virtual, but do they have annual conferences? Do they have publications? What are the benefits yeah. of belonging to your organization? Yes, yeah, so they definitely do have uh, conferences. And because of COVID, they are doing like virtual conferences as well. Um, they do have publications. You get certain discounts for um, certain tax wear sometimes, or you get a discount off of a class because they offer a lot of different um, self-study courses as well to improve your knowledge. And if you're not a member, you pay like, a higher rate 
than you would if you were a member. So they offer it to everybody, but if you're a, if you're a member, you get the extra discount. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's pretty good. They send you emails. You're able to ask questions, you know, other society, if you're like really stuck on something hard. So I like that aspect of it as well. Okay, that's good. So we have another question here from Miss Alexander. So what else is it that one can do with the EA besides tax prep and resolution? Okay, so if you don't want to be your own business owner, you could always use that credential to work at a CPA firm or resolution firm. Um, but other than that, you know, the primary focus of being a credentialed um, enrolled agent is to represent taxpayers. So if that's not, you know, what you want to do, then that may not be the route that you should go, right? Unless you want to take it to another point where you become a mentor and you help other people study for the exam, you help other people build up their practices and things of that nature. So you could take it in that route. Okay. So tell me a little bit. So earlier you had talked about the exam that you have to take, and it's a three-part exam. Yes. So give, give us a little information about that exam, because it sounds pretty daunting. It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would say it's definitely daunting for someone who may not have any tax experience. Okay. Because the first part is built on individual taxation, right? So that part was, you know, a walk in the park for me to take because that's all I pretty much focused on in the beginning of my career was just individual taxes. Um, then you have to take an ethic part. With, so that way you'll know the rules and regulations on how you are supposed to act ethically and things of that nature. But then the, the one part that trips up everybody is part two, which is the corporate taxation part of it all. So that's where you learn how to calculate basis for stocks. Um, you learn about partnerships and how to do that, corporations. And to be all transparent, I failed it the first time, <laughs> you know, okay. and, and and it's because I focus so much on getting knowledge on basis that mm -hmm. I forgot about my farmers. Right. Oh. And yeah, because you have to learn about farmers because farmers have a whole schedule that they have to fill oh out. If Yeah. If you're in that industry. So I didn't really think that was going to be a major part of the exam. So when I took the exam the first time, why was the last 10 questions <laughs> all about farmers? And I was just like, OMG, like I knew when, when I didn't pass, I knew exactly why I didn't pass because I didn't focus on that area. Right. Yeah. So when I took, I took it, I scheduled it a week later and I was able to pass it the second time around. So I would definitely say, you know, you really have to study hard. Okay. Understand the concepts. Just don't memorize. Because I know a lot of us, we get in the habit of when we take exams, mm -hmm. we just kind of just memorize the content and just hope that the question uh, will appear the exact same way that we did it when we were taking, you know, the practice exams. But it's more to you really have to understand the why. Okay. Why, why, is, why is that the right answer? Okay. So would you recommend for someone... Um, coming out of high school that was not planning on going to a four-year college. Um, you mentioned, you know, going maybe to a community college to get a certificate. So how much would you recommend them looking at that practice exam beforehand? Definitely look at it beforehand. Even try to, you know, H&R Black, I believe, has like their own tax course do some, you know, work at, a, you know, one of those firms, Liberty Tax, Jackson, one of those commercial firms. So that way you can get some type of experience dealing with taxes, because when you become an enrolled agent, it, it doesn't teach you how to do taxes. It just teaches you the, the theory and how to do certain things. But you really have to have that hands on experience to really fully you know, do taxes. So I even, I'm part of like a, a Facebook group when I did my exam. There's like a Facebook group out there for anybody that's interested that wants to take the exam. It's called um, IRS EA exam group. 
I'll actually I'll email it to you later, um, Belinda. Once I um, because I don't know at the top of my head, but that was a really great group. They're really there. They're the cheerleaders. You can ask questions as you're doing your review. If you don't understand something, there's plenty of people there who have already passed the test can actually help you understand it better. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Why I mentioned that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about um, what should someone do, a young person do that is planning, oh. not necessarily planning. Right. And so one of the things that people suggest in that group too, just because you have that credential, mm -hmm. they always recommend mentoring under somebody else or working at a CPA firm or working at a commercial firm. So that way you get some of that hand on, hands on knowledge if you don't already have it. Because okay. once to be a tax professional, you don't have to have any type of education. To become a tax preparer is one of the easiest things to do. You can wake up one morning and say, hey, I want to do taxes. And you could just hang up your shingle. And then you have, you buy the software and then you're up and running. Okay. Well, that's interesting to know because, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I am a college counselor and I do love it when folks go on to higher ed, but I also know that that's not the road for everybody. Right. So knowing that someone could go into this particular career um, with just studying, maybe getting a certificate, getting work experience first first off um, before they go in and take that exam. So that's really, that's really something good to know. Um, so would you recommend for, so for someone that was interested in going this route, um, would you, would, would you recommend owning your own business or working for someone else? Well, to be biased, I would say <laughs> <laughs> working for yourself, right? Because what I like to tell people is when you are working for someone there's a cap on how much you can make, oh, right? Okay. That person may only be willing to pay you $50,000 a year, right? Right. You can't say, well, I have this credential, I have this experience, so you have to pay me $80,000. They'll say, okay, next, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but when you work for yourself, you put yourself in a position where your, your earnings is, is unlimited. Right. Okay. You can charge however much you want to charge. You can have as many clients as you feel that you can, you know, have. You can even go and, you know, hire other tax people. So that way, you know, now you have an actual office with other professionals that you could, you know, make money off of them as well. So your earnings is is unlimited when you work for yourself and then your freedom. Right. You could, yes. you know, structure however you want your life to be. You don't have to say, hey, boss, can I take next Friday off? <laughs> you know, can I have a week off? Oh, I'm not feeling good today. I'm calling out. You know, so those things when you are you're, when you're self-employed, you run the show. If you don't want to work that day, you don't have to work that day. Yeah. You want to take a vacation? Just notify your clients that, hey, I'm going away for, you know, a certain amount of time. That's great. That's great. So for those of you that may just be joining in with us or that are watching this on the replay, we are here with Amber Whitehead, who is an IRS enrolled agent, and she's also the owner of Whitehead Tax and Financial Services, LLC. So anybody out there with a the small business that's looking for someone to help them with their taxes, Ms. Whitehead is the person for you. So, so, so check it out. And I will actually put her... Um, her website up here. Oh, I actually put the new one up. Oh, you have a new one. Okay. Yes. Right. It'll be up. Well, it's still under construction, but that okay. website will be null and void come to first. So the other one is whiteheadtax.com. Nice okay. and easy. All right. <laughs> So what I will do, what I always do is I uh, go back and I put stuff in the show notes and update things. So I'll make sure I update that so everybody will have that information. So um, Amber, what is it? What advice would you give to someone who has taken the exam and they're still not quite sure what they want to do with that certificate? So is it a certificate that you receive? Um, yes. Okay. 
So, yeah. and, and they're not quite sure what they want to do or they want to explore some other careers in that area. Like what suggestions would you have for them? I want people to be able to, you know, have as many options as possible. Right. Um, they just now received the license. What can they, what should they do? I would really say they need, they should ask the question, who do they want to serve mm. and why they want to serve them, right? So do you want to just serve the, the taxpayer who just needs help with filings? Or do you want to represent the taxpayer who is struggling with tax debt or has an audit that they have to, um, you know, go through, right? For me, both of them was ideal for me because I love helping people. I get satisfaction of someone seeing, wow, I didn't know that if I changed my W-4 or if I contributed more to my 401k, I could save money on my taxes being a, you know, a wage earner or, oh, wow, I didn't know that I can actually claim my home office as a business expense, you know, or wow, I didn't know you could really sell, you know, settle tax debt for pennies on a dollar, like all those commercials that you, you know, that you hear. Right. So I get satisfaction just out of just helping. So I would think is just find out what your true passion is and which direction that you want to go. Right. Because from becoming an EA, there's also another type of credential that you can take, which is called um, a U.S. I always get it. So many letters, a USCCP, which is a U.S. tax court practitioner. So if you're the one that, you know, you like law and you wanted to be a lawyer, but you kind of like tax and you want to merge the two together, then I would think becoming a U.S. tax court practitioner would be ideal because our credentials stop at an audit once we have to go into court. So I can't go into court okay. with somebody for a tax issue. I can only handle audits through the IRS, what they call desk audits, you know, where, you know, I just mail them the, the, the information that they need and things of that nature. But as far as representing them in court, I can't do that. I would have to go to the next level and become a U.S. tax court practitioner. So that is another option as well. If you, okay. you know, are into the whole law lawyer thing, okay. you're not a lawyer, but you act as one. Okay. Wow. See, I learned something new every day because again, <laughs> another, another career pathway that I did not know about. It's, it's so amazing. All the, when we start looking at all the careers that are out there and all the different possible ways that you can go. And that's why I'm always like telling kids, don't, don't get too concerned right now about what am I going to major in? What am I going to major in? Because it may be something that you'll find out about once you get on that college campus or once you get out there in the work world and, and see right. what what's out there for you. What do you like? What is the least part of... Listen to me. I can't talk right today. <laughs> what, what part of your job do you dislike the most? <sighs> that you can't make everybody happy. You know, because you're always going to get, you know, that one person that is just not satisfied that, you know, they owe this money or they thought their refund should be bigger or they thought they should have got a better settlement with the IRS. Um, so it's things like that that I that I don't like the most about my job is that, okay. you know, I don't have the final say. OK, that's true. That's true. Have you ever had a client that um, wanted you to be unethical? <laughs> yes, and I did not, and I did not um, engage with them. Once I found out what they wanted me to do, I said, "No, that's a little bit too unethical for me." And I've worked so hard mm -hmm. to put myself in this position to just have it taken away because I really stand on my integrity and um, I don't want anything to put a cloud over that. Yes. So I'm not going to do anything unethical because this is what I work for. 
Exactly. Exactly. And why would you jeopardize all of that hard work? Right. It's not worth it. What, no. just to save them, you know, a couple of thousand dollars or to make them look better on paper? It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's That seems to be, you know, I don't know, this day and age, sometimes folks are always trying to look for the get over. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so what? So let me see here. Um. So you talked about, so would you do this if you had your chance to, if you were starting all over again, would this be the same career that you would choose? I think so, especially if the unemployment situation happened, because I don't think if I was unemployed for two and a half years that I would really have considered being a business owner. I really think that was my aha moment because I was so tunnel vision. I just wanted to be a partner, wanted to be a partner, wanted to be a partner. And you couldn't tell me anything else. And then unemployment hit and that changed yeah. everything. And that changed, changed everything. everything. So yep. what, what, what trends do you see um, on the horizon for this field? Do you see this field growing? I do see it growing because, and the reason why I see it growing is because now a lot of people are taking the do-it-yourself option, right? They're filing their taxes themselves and all people are not tax people, right? That's a little right. saying that we joke around in, in our little <laughs> Facebook group. We say all tax people, all people are not tax people, right? Um, because you make mistakes. If you are really not versed and you're just relying on a program to ask you questions about your tax situation, you could click the wrong button and it'll bring you to a form that you're not supposed to go to, you know? So because of that, you may end up putting yourself in a position where you have to get audited, or you may put yourself in a position where you start accumulating all this tax debt. So enrolled agents are going to become essential, if especially if you focus on the representation. I think that's where um, the focus is going to be more so for enrolled agents is representation because of so much do-it-yourself tax software is out there. Right. And I could really see that, see how this will be expanding because so many people are becoming entrepreneurs right? and starting their own businesses. I know um, when I started mine, it was like, oh, I got to do this stuff. Let me go find somebody because I know I don't <laughs> like numbers. This is, that is not my forte. I know that is a weakness of mine. So there was right. no way I was even going. I mean, I said, I don't even, I, I think after I, maybe after I got out of college, maybe high school, I don't know. I didn't even want to do my own taxes anymore. Right. <laughs> I just didn't because I just said, oh, mm, I don't know here. We need to find somebody to do this because this is not this is not me this is not my t my cup of tea so right I definitely i definitely hear what you're saying on how this will be something that um will probably grow will probably grow actually i think when i looked at onet i think they actually had it as um a uh, bright outlook so that they projected growth for this particular area mm. so, so that's that's good to know that is so good to know for um people right um, so are there any particular, um, well, you did say you, you have, you read books about small business and what have you, because see, I'm always talking to my kids. I, I'm always saying, so what are you reading? <laughs> and they're like, well, I'm not really reading anything. If, if the teacher didn't assign it, then like, I'm right. not reading. And I'm like, okay, so how are you going to continue learning if you don't read? Right. So, so I love what you said about, you know, you're reading books about small business in order to, um, keep abreast of all the trends and whatever else is changing to make sure that you're on top of things so that when you go and, and work for your clients that you're doing what's right for them. So right. you, so how does that compare with um, how you keep yourself educated for the work you do at UConn? Well, for UConn is different because I don't really do anything tax related okay. for UConn. So I would say to kind of offset that I read other like self-help books, you know, about time management, you know, um, how to write, how to write better, you know, cause emails is a big thing, especially now that everybody is working from home. Right. You want to make sure that when you're typing up that email, um, the tone is right in there. Mm. Cause if you use certain words, 
It may sound like, you know, you're arguing with someone or you're mad at them. So you have to um, read things, you know, how to write a correct email, what tone you should use, just communication, you know. Okay. I love that you talked about that because earlier when you were talking about um, you love the work because you love people. So I see in there where people have to have great people skills. This is not a job, right. uh, a career where you're, you know, you're sitting behind a desk and you're just being yourself. You know, you've got to be able to interact with people. So I, I love that you said that and the communication skills, problem solving skills. So all you folks right. out there that are thinking about moving into this field, you know, sit down and really do an assessment of what it is that, um, what are your strengths? What are your right. strengths? Is, is this a business that you can see yourself doing and, and going into? And I, I love what you said about taking this and moving it into um, owning your own business. You know, right. I, I just think we're moving in that direction in, in so many ways. And the internet certainly does has helped us. And I think, you know, if there's a silver lining in coronavirus, if there is, it could be, it could that, be more that more people, people are inclined to mm -hmm. um, own their Start own business. businesses right. and to do that. So any other questions out there from our audience? So people that are just joining in, that are coming in, we are with Ms. Amber Whitehead, who is the owner of Whitehead Tax and Financial Services in Connecticut. And she's also an IRS enrolled agent. And for those of you that did not hear her description of what an IRS enrolled agent does, please make sure you listen to the replay. Please make sure you share this with people. Um, we will be putting it on um, YouTube also. So if you, don't, you have friends that aren't on Facebook and they want to learn more about Miss Whitehead and the work that she does, you can, you'll be able to catch the replay also on YouTube. So, Ms. Whitehead, any parting words that you'd like to give to our audience? Hmm, parting words. <laughs> Always remember there's no such thing as job security, mm. right? So I encourage everyone out there, do not rely solely on your nine to five job, right? Okay. You don't necessarily have to be a business owner. Maybe you can get into real estate investing, you know, buy rental properties, invest in the stock market, you know, purchase uh, vending machines. There's so many different things that you can do where you don't necessarily have to be a business owner, but you definitely need to have that additional stream of income because if you do get unemployed, unemployment, if it's not a pandemic or a, a serious situation, you don't, depending on the state that you live in, I know right. in Connecticut, we get six months. I heard other states, you only get three months of unemployment, right? Right. So what happens when your unemployment is gone? You're going to max out, you're going to withdraw your, all your 401k money. Then when that, when that is all gone, what do you, what do you have then? Right. So right. if you don't have that additional stream of income to support you, you're going to be at a loss. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. Thank you for that. So folks, you know that I always like to talk about at least one book um, before the session officially ends. So the book today is, let me see if I can get it here in the, in the screen. It's called 100 Conversations for Career Success. Learn to network, cold call, and tweet your way to your dream job. And it's by Laura Labovich and Miriam Saul Peter. And of course, as always, I will put this information in the show notes. But I think it's so important for folks, even high school folks, you need to know, like, I always tell my kids, even though, you know, the ones that are going to college, and we talk about careers and preparing themselves for careers. And I like, you know, when you get out of college, you're going to work. You know, right. you're, not, you're, not, you're not going home. You're not going home and living in your parents' basement. You're going to work. Right. So whether work. you go to a four-year college, a two-year college, um, join the military, uh, become an apprentice, the bottom line is you're going to be going to work. So mm -hmm. you need to practice all those skills that you need, those interviewing skills. There's a fantastic chapter in, in here on informational interviews, which I definitely recommend that all students do. Find someone, for those of you that are interested in, you know, being an IRS enrolled agent, Miss Whitehead, 
fantastic person to talk to about that work. I mean, um, she's just given you some great information about this career. So if it was something that you wanted to continue doing or you wanted to look further into, you know, I'm sure, you know, you could go onto her website and get her contact information. And we'll be putting that in the show notes and, and ask a few more questions because that's how we learn by asking questions. Oh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes. Yes, I love that. I love that. I am so thrilled we had this opportunity to have this conversation. And I am so glad that uh, my student, Kelly, um, mentioned this to me because I don't know if she realized it or not, but when she said IRS enrolled agent, if she could, I don't know if she saw the look on my face, but I'm like, oh, what? what? (laughs) <laughs> what 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 is that and like as soon as we got offline i was like okay let me google this because i've never heard of an irs enrolled agent but she seemed to have a pretty good idea of what it was but not not oh, the okay. details not the okay. details and i was like part of i was kind of like oh so you don't have to go to college and then when i read about the exam but i said okay i need somebody that's in this line of work right to, to give us a little bit of information about it so I thank you so much. This has been You're absolutely welcome. delightful. It's been so informative. And again, for folks out there that are watching this on the replay, we are with Amber Whitehead, who is an IRS enrolled agent. And she also has a business where she works with small businesses and takes care of their accounting. So her information will be in the show notes. So if you're looking for a tax person for your small business, hey, we're all virtual now. So right. you don't have to be in the same state. So I no. definitely would, you know, definitely, definitely encourage you to reach out to Miss Whitehead if you're looking for it. Um, some extra help. And we have a comment here from Miss Alexander where she says, thank you for your insights. Not so, a problem. So Katrina, thank you so much for joining in. I appreciate you supporting this um, broadcast. And I also appreciate that you were putting um, notes in there so that people would have the information. All right. So again, folks, I'll see you next Monday. It'll be November, well, yeah, November 2nd. So it'll be the day after. Ooh. Students. No, the day have, Yeah, day after students have done their um, early action for some of the colleges. November um, around, in the college world, November first and November fifteenth. Uh, well, October fifteenth, we've already passed by, but November first and November fifteenth are early action application deadlines. Oh. And so November is like, <laughs> you know, and the night before is like, okay. Do you have this essay written? What are you doing? You know, because you know, kids, you know, right. people are changing their mind or plus they're all going to school. So it, it's it's crazy. So, folks, I hope to be with you next Monday. You know, <laughs> I, I might be a little under the weather after the first. Right. And I said, but I will see you um, Monday, November 2nd. 7 p.m. Eastern time. Actually, the time changes too next Sunday. Oh, yeah. So, yes, right. make sure you do that and take care of that. And it's make the sure day before do. the election. <laughs> oh, girl, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thank you so much, Miss Whitehead, to stay on with us while I end this. Thank okay. you again, everyone, for joining in, and um, we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.